Early civilizations often built drainage systems in urban areas to handle rainwater that ran down the street during a storm. The Romans constructed elaborate systems that also drained wastewater from the public baths. However, as the population of the cities grew, the old drainage systems became overloaded. During the Industrial Revolution, manufacturing waste was added to sewage, which increased the need for more efficient sewage treatment. In the mid-19th century, the first steps were taken to treat wastewater. Sewage or wastewater treatment in modern times is the process of removing harmful physical, chemical and biological elements from wastewater and house sewage. The whole process starts with screening out large objects such as paper and wood, and removing heavy materials like dirt. The screened wastewater is then ready to go through a series of concrete tanks for further treatment. In the second step, the sewage passes into the primary tanks. Here, human waste, called sludge, settles to the bottom while oils and grease float to the top, where they are collected. At the same time, organic matter like eggshells or coffee grounds in the sewage is broken down into smaller substances. The remaining sewage then enters the secondary tanks for the third stage of treatment. The solids that were not treated in the primary tanks are removed here through decomposition which digests the material. Then, the liquid sewage is filtered through sand. This filtering process gets rid of almost all bacteria, as well as other solid particles that remain in the water. Finally, the wastewater flows into the last tanks, where the chemical chlorine is added to kill the remaining bacteria. After the bacteria are destroyed, the chlorine is eliminated from the water and the treated clean water is discharged into a river or the ocean. The planet's deepest point is in the Pacific Ocean's Mariana Trench, which lies miles below the sea surface. According to a new study published in Nature Ecology and Evolution, even in this remote locale, creatures cannot escape pollution. A team of researchers recently sent a remotely operated vehicle into the depths of the Mariana Trench. They found that extraordinarily high levels of forbidden industrial chemicals are contaminating marine life more than seven miles deep in the trench. The small hard-shelled marine life that the robotic submarine brought to the surface was polluted with toxic chemicals, with toxin levels 50 times greater than those of the most heavily polluted rivers in the world. These pollution levels were not the only alarming aspect of the discovery. The types of compounds found were all considered persistent organic pollutants, POPs, meaning they stick around in the environment for a very long time. Two of the most prevalent types are PCBS and PBDEs. PCBS were once used in many industrial applications, but were outlawed in the United States in the 1970s after being linked to cancer. Similarly, PBDEs were used in a wide range of products from electronics to couch cushions. Neither chemical breaks down in the environment. These compounds stick to the surface of materials like plastic. Many creatures mistakenly eat this colorful but toxic material, causing the pops to build up in their bodies, lurking in their fat tissues. When these sea creatures die, their pop-riddled bodies sink to the ocean floor where deep-sea marine life eat their remains. Pops are therefore transferred to other creatures along the food chain. The Mariana Trench is many miles away from any industrial source. This suggests that these pollutants travel over long distances despite having been prohibited worldwide decades ago. The All Blacks, New Zealand's national rugby team, is widely credited for bringing the haka to the world stage. Immediately before kickoff, the whole team will issue a warlike chant, stamping their feet, slapping their thighs, rolling their eyes, flicking their tongues, and making aggressive gestures in unison. This performance before each match, which is intended to heighten their morale and intimidate opponents, is a sight to behold. 
No other international sporting team possesses a pre-match ritual as powerful as the famed All Blacks Hakka. What does Hakka mean? Hakka is often thought of as a broad term for Mori war dances traditionally used to intimidate the enemy and prepare the warriors for battle. Most people believe it was performed either on the battlefield prior to engaging the enemy, or as the warriors were leaving their own village en route to a battle. But in the language of Mori, the word Hakka simply means a dance. The dance is accompanied by a chant that expresses emotions or tells ancient stories. While many Hakka should be performed by males, there are some Hakka that can be performed by anyone, male or female. There are even some women-only Hakka. Thanks to the All Blacks, two of the Hakka have become widely renowned, Kamate and Kappa Opango. The former was composed by a Mori chief in the early 1800s about how he outsmarted his enemies. It was first performed by the All Blacks in 1906. The latter was written specifically for the team in 2005. They are now performed interchangeably by the All Blacks. Today, different varieties of Hakka are performed on various ceremonial occasions from receiving distinguished guests to birthdays, weddings, or the funerals of chiefs and people of high status. Though the practice had traditionally been limited to Mora communities, it has now spread far beyond that. Mori and New Zealanders of European heritage alike view doing the haka with a sense of pride, both on the rugby field and outside it. The haka has become the most recognisable symbol of New Zealanders as a people. In 2015, President Obama of the USA signed the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESA, replacing the Bush era No Child Left Behind. NCLB, that had been in effect since 2001. This new act provides states with more decision-making power regarding curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Below are some big-picture ideas influencing many states as they approach the assessment task. One important idea is flexibility. For years, states have used standardized K-12 assessments, similar to the SAT and Act for College Application, to measure student achievement. They are easy to use, but they fail to give a complete picture of how a student is progressing. Thus, states are rethinking one-size-fits-all standardized assessments and are instead considering personalized, student-centered assessments in schools. Obviously, the task is difficult and time-consuming. Fortunately, Modern technology can help solve this dilemma. For instance, computer adaptive assessments can automatically adjust questions based on a student's performances on the previous questions. This mechanism prevents the computer from giving questions that are obviously too easy or too difficult for the student. It thus allows teachers to quickly assess a student's level of understanding and provide instant feedback to help in the learning process. Another idea is multi-subject testing. Several states have started to incorporate subjects beyond the traditional math and reading items in their K-12 assessments. All 50 states include tests on science at least twice prior to senior high school, and some are now starting to include social studies, government, or economics. Some states are also moving toward assessing multiple subjects on one test, for example, reading and social studies. A third idea is the emphasis on students' learning process. In pursuit of a student-centered approach, many states are putting more emphasis on assessments throughout the learning process rather than on traditional end-of-year summative tests. Teachers are encouraged to accumulate data at different points in their students' learning process. These data together present a more complete picture of a student's learning. The last idea regards the purpose of assessment. Assessment should be used to inform both teachers' instruction and students' learning. Teachers can modify their teaching based on students' performance on tests, students can identify their own problems and make plans for improvement.